But we don't have to worry about that. I'm going to change my movies now. I don't know any of these people. If you know how to. Only R-G-I-N. Yeah. Um, C-O-S-T-A. Like that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Hey guys, whoever's West Division Two, can you please identify yourself? Whoever is West Division Two, can you please identify yourself or rename your? Yeah, I was. I'm trying to figure out how to rename it right now, but it's Wendy Nintman. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Hi, Donna. Hi, John. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for facilitating our meeting. Yeah. It's hard to get everything situated so you can manage your computer and see and hear all of that stuff. I'm lucky. I have three screens at work, so I have three different things open, and I can just drag them over. I keep grabbing the wrong mouse, though, because I'm on <laughs> the computers. John, I like your COVID beard. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's getting a big trim tonight. And it's going to come off in July with my birthday. Excellent. It's definitely the longest I've ever had a beard before. It took me a minute to really believe it was you. <laughs> That's what everybody says. John, I think you can begin if you'd like to. Ross is running a few minutes late. Okay, hold on just a second. <clears throat> okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, welcome to the Missoula Parks and Recreation June 9, 2020 meeting. All the meeting body members are attending the meeting remotely. We are holding this meeting virtually, so we'll be doing public comment a little differently than usual via a live call-in phone line. Those numbers are going to be displayed on your screen and are either toll-free at 888-475-4499 or 1-253-215-8782. And our meeting ID is 960-049-3694. As a quick reminder to our board members and staff, please do not use the chat feature of Zoom during the meeting. Shortly, I will call for general comment. And on that general comment item, I will take comments on items that are on the agenda and items that are not on the agenda. I will also open the public comment phone lines on each agenda item. Each time we call for public comment, we'll put the numbers on the screen in the meeting ID and give some time for you to go to your phones and call in, but you may wanna write them down. When you do call in, you'll be placed into a waiting room and I will take calls in the order they come in. When I call on you, please mute your TV or computer or there will be an echo. Tell us your name and your comment. Please be aware there's a delay of about 50 seconds from what you're hearing at home and the actual meeting. So it's okay to begin speaking right away when I call on you. I'll be observing a speaking limit of three minutes so we can hear from everyone. So let's get started. I'd like to call the meeting of the Missoula Parks and Recreation Board to order. Can we have a roll call of members to determine who is present? Thank you, John. Margie? I think you're on mute still. Okay, hi, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. John? I'm here. Danny? Here. Wendy? Here. I note that Sonia and Dale are absent, as well as Ross. Thank you very much. Our, our next ag agenda item is the approval of the minutes from the May 12, 2020 meeting. Those minutes were available on eScribe, and I'll take any comments or a motion to approve.
Margie or Daniel, you'll probably have to make the motion since you were the one present at the meeting. I motion to approve the minutes. Great, I'll need a second. I second. Any comment on the agenda, excuse me, on the minutes? Seeing none, we'll vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The meeting minutes are approved. Uh, administrative business item 1.3, any announcements? Do we have any announcements to make from the public or anyone else? Uh, this is Donna, Director of Parks and Recreation. And a uh, brief announcement, I can cover it more later as we get into reports, but we do uh, anticipate a very partial opening of Splash and Currents starting on Monday. It's been a very, very slow process with COVID and interpretation of uh, governor's phase two orders and health officer orders and the uh, low numbers restrictions. Uh, we'll also be starting out sports leagues uh, as well as summer camps. And so things are progressing nicely and uh, staff has been absolutely uh, outstanding in adherence to COVID best practices and keeping themselves and our customers and park visitors safe. Thank you, Donna. I'd just like to also announce, I, I visited a few parks in the last week and I'm really happy with their condition and what the staff have been able to do under a lot of duress. So um, thanks to the staff for that. The parks look great. Thank you. We're catching up on weeds, but we're getting there. <laughs> Any other announcements? All right, we'll move to administrative business item 1.4. This is where we'll take public and guest comments and we will open it up to the public. We'll give everybody a little bit of time to get to their phones and uh, there might be some silence here for a few minutes. Give about 30 more seconds before we move on. If you have any public or guest comments, please dial in now. All right, seeing no public or guest comments, we will move on. Um, item two, action items. We have no action items on the agenda today. So I'm getting to chair once again, a, an easy meeting. <laughs> and so we'll move right into agenda item number three, our presentations and discussions. We'll be at item 3.1, the downtown North Riverside Parks and Trails master plan and process update. Nathan. Hi guys. Um, I'm gonna try and share my screen. So let me see if this will work. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, let me get back to the top page. Bear with me. Okay. Okay, so the North Riverside Parks and Trails plan has been under development for um, probably almost a year now. It came out of the downtown master plan and we have just recently closed our public comment period for the draft plan. We presented this in a virtual setting on engagemissoula.com. Engage um, and it was kind of an interesting way to present to the public a project. We were the first project on engagemissoula.com, so we kind of worked out some kinks along the way, but I think it was very successful. Um, we had total visits of 
2.1 thousand, so 2,100 visits. So pretty good views. Um, the way that Engage Missoula breaks the visitors down, it actually tracks what they do on the site. And so you can see we had 292 visitors that were engaged. Um, so that means that that was 292 people actually filled out the survey. Um, 934 people actually clicked through the site, watched the video, looked at some different pages. And then 1.7 thousand people um, at least clicked on one page and visited the site to see just some basic information. Um, and so then there's a chart that kind of shows we had some peaks that I think were primarily related to news and media coverage that we had of the project, which was really great. We, um, the Missoulian covered it, the Missoula Current, KPAX covered this project. Um, and then we also released press releases to all of our partners across Missoula. So I'll start with looking at Karis, East Karis, and Best Reed Park. Um, so these were the parks that we had uh, hired Dover Cole and Associates to, Dover Cole and Partners to help us with the design. And this is the, the design that we have come up with over the past year. I think you all are somewhat familiar with this. Um, I hope that you went to Engage Missoula and saw the project as well. There were some really neat videos on there, um, some cool animation, some going into a lot of depth about this design. Um, this is a 3D rendering of the, of the design of Karis Park. So then we had a survey. It was pretty brief, um, took about three minutes per person to fill out. Uh, and we started with some basic questions. So what features would you most likely use as a resident? And so the farmer's market came in pretty, pretty high on people's lists, also events. River access was really important to people and the riverfront promenade. These four things were kind of the, the top picks. And then we have the Higgins Avenue underpass activation and the ice ribbon were about the same. And then the carousel and exercise equipment were a little bit less exciting to people. The next question was what features would you most likely bring your out of town guests to? So again, the same top four Features came out, farmer's market events, river access and riverfront promenade. And then the, the other four are kind of neck and neck here further down. And feel free to interrupt, with, interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, we asked what excites you the most? So events, river access, year round activation and entrances and pathways were all pretty high. River access seems to be the most exciting thing. And we've heard this over the course of many years, people really want to be able to get to the river. Um, and this design really allows for that. So e even includes accessible access down to the water. So then um, activation under the Higgins Avenue bridge is a big part of this project, but it was something that we really wanted to get a lot of specific input from people about. We have a lot of ideas. Um, but we wanted to see what the public wanted to have under there. So we left this a little bit open and that's why we have a specific question for it. So what features would you most likely use under the Higgins Avenue bridge? So climbing walls, climbing features was really popular. Um, the idea of putting lighting and artwork in that space. So painting the bridge structure itself was really popular. And then we had proposed the idea of a bicycle pump track of um, some kind of swing style seats that we got the idea from Lawn on D in Boston. They have these really neat seats that you can hang out, literally hang out in. Um, so th something like that was popular. We're proposing putting in a really big slide from the Higgins Avenue bridge down into the park. That was pretty popular. And then we have um, sport courts, kids games, ballet, bicycle parking, and table tennis. So I think this was really helpful for us to see what, you know, I think we're on the right track. Um, and it also was nice to see what people really want to have. So the following questions, we had people rank the different amenities. So the top is the most popular one. So Riverfront Promenade is gonna come up in pretty much all of these questions as the number one pick. Um, all Seasons Restroom was really important. An updated amphitheater, raised multi-use lawn. In the proposal, we're actually proposing basically cutting the top off of the big hill in Karis Park to create a more multi-use, multi-purpose lawn space. Um, ADA river access. I think it's kind of interesting this didn't rank as high, but then in the previous questions, it was really popular. Um, 
and an, an ice ribbon is a little bit less popular and the Ryman Street Gateway came in last. So then what proposed features improvements do you like best in East Karis Park? So again, riverfront pro promenade, updated pathways, multi-use lawn space were the top picks, updated market plaza area, art wall around the electrical substation, seasonal restroom and big art in the park. Um, so we asked what proposed features or improvements do you like best in Best Reed Park? So it just, I think this is interesting, a rain garden and a boardwalk actually ranked higher than the riverfront promenade, although not by very much. Um, updated park pathways, naturalistic ADA river access, dem demonstration garden, outdoor exercise equipment, and wedding event pavilion. So we asked, um, we also asked questions that were optional for people to fill out. Um, and this was things that people could write in. So what I would change about the design and why. So you'll see parkour is a big word here. Um, so during COVID, the local parkour gym actually closed. And it seems that the people who are associated with that gym jumped onto this project and thought that this would be a great place for parkour. And so we got a lot of comments about parkour. Um, I think a lot of that is probably due to the closing of that gym and the fact that they organized around this park. So take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but I think it is, there's some potential for that being a really good option under the Higgins Avenue bridge. Uh, we heard a lot of people um, really liked ADA access. They wanted more natural space. Um, some people had some thoughts about the ice ribbon, maybe not being something that they would like to do. Although I think, um, I think that probably the reason that we're seeing some comments about the ice ribbon not being a feature people want is because they don't know what an ice ribbon is. Um, Donna has some good examples about Splash Montana being the same and um, it's extremely popular now. So. so we asked, what if any other features would you like to see in the parks? Again, parkour came up, um, better lighting, native, more native plants, more trees, covered bicycle parking, unique artwork. A lot of the stuff that came up in this question is things that we have been thinking about, but that will be designed during design development and are just more detailed than what we could include in a conceptual master plan. So questions about the design that need to be addressed. Um, not surprisingly, challenging behaviors came up a lot. So people were concerned with transients in the park and just all, all the behavior that goes along with that. Uh, parking came up a lot. I think it's interesting. There were, of course, people that wanted to see more parking and didn't want to see parking taken away. But then there was actually people who were like, why don't we take all the parking away? So it was nice to see that there is people on both sides of that argument. And then is there anything else you'd like to share? A lot of people really like the designs. They think it's great and they're excited about it. Um, people were concerned with sustainability. There was people that wanted to see alternatives to the ice ribbon or alternatives to um, asphalt and concrete. So I think sustainability is something that we really need to consider during design development. Um, again, challenging behaviors came up. So, but I think overall the comments were really positive. So demographics of it, pretty, this question I didn't get into the survey at the beginning. Um, so um, there was only 87 responses to this out of the 300, but you can see it's a pretty good spread of ages. And then this is the same for the, where people are commenting from. So what's your closest elementary school? Again, only 84 responses, um, but again, pretty good, pretty good spread across Missoula for this. So then we had a separate survey for downtown Lions and Kiwanis Park. And these master plans we developed in-house with Parks and Rec staff. So this is downtown Lions. And then this is the plan for Kiwanis Park. We did have less people fill out these surveys. I think there's what, 73 responses. So Ron's River Trail, River Access are ranking really highly. Um, in the plan, we're proposing widening Ron's River Trail, creating better connections along the river. And that's really got people pretty excited. Um, so what excites you the most about Kiwanis Downtown Lions plans? Again, river trail connections, river access, entrances and open lawns. So one of the proposals for Kiwanis is a, a better entrance that connects to the new library on Front Street. 
Um, and so I think that's where people are thinking about here for entrances. So again, we had people rank the different proposed features. Um, so what do you like best in downtown Lions parks? Improved trail and park lighting, river access, multi-use lawn, playground, picnic pavilion, community garden, and then the surf wave ranked last. So what proposed improvements do you like best in Kiwanis? Future Ron's River Trail connections east and west of Kiwanis Park. So that would be um, currently the connection to the west of Kiwanis. You have to do a big turn to go through and along Lavasser Street. And then the same is the case for going east. You'd have to go around the Doubletree Hotel. So we're proposing more direct connections there in the future. Updated park pathways, better views of the river, the gateway on Front Street, multi-use lawn, bocce ball, and lawn games, additional sand volleyball court and pickleball courts. I did get a letter of support for the volleyball courts from the volleyball community. Um, they're really excited about adding courts to this park. They thought that it would be a better location than even the ones in Playfair. Um, and they actually were like, add three. So um, maybe the general public didn't like it as much, but the volleyball community was, was excited about it. Hey, Nathan, can I just, uh, for clarification, for anybody who might not have taken the survey, just so everybody understands, um, in the surveys, I'm assuming then the number one is the highest. So yes, that's, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So what I would change about the design and why, again, this is downtown Lions and Kiwanis Park, so better security, I think that's, um, Obvious for us, that's definitely what we are, our goal is, especially for downtown Lions Park. That's one of the main reasons for doing this plan. Um, updated signage, more trees, lighting, all those things are gonna come out in our design development of these parks. What if any other features would you like to see in these parks? Better trail connections, wider trails, more permeable surfaces. So again, environmental sustainability is coming up. Um, people want to see more restrooms, more trees. Questions about the design that need to be addressed. So challenging behaviors uh, is, is coming up again. Parking, of course, funding. And then is there anything else you'd like to share? So this is a question that people can talk about anything. Um, but we heard they like the plans. Um, they want to see healthy activities for all ages. Enforcing the leash law. People don't want to see herbicides as much as possible. And then again, demographics. So the age was a pretty good spread on this survey and the same thing for where people are commenting from. And that's it. I can answer any questions if you have any questions. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so I did this a little backwards. What I should have done right before you spoke is to announce that we will take public comments as well after your presentation. We're gonna go ahead and, um, and do that now. If you can put those numbers back on the screen so that if anybody is interested, they can call in for public comment. While we're waiting for that, if there's any comment from the board, um, that'd be great. Margie, you're still on mute. I unmuted me. <laughs> Um, Nathan, that was an excellent uh, presentation, and I thought it was a very interesting way to engage presenters. I went on both uh, engaged Missoula and, and did the surveys, and also went around and just randomly spoke with friends and family what they thought of the the proposals. and And I think my the reactions I also personally received were very similar to what you received in the survey, and I think that. The keys I heard was the promenade is so important. The events are um, adequate restrooms. And of course, I got most comments about the ice ribbon. <laughs> like, what is it? How will we maintain it? It's a pretty high budget item. And I think it's kind of what you said is maybe people, I don't know if I even know what an ice ribbon is, but um, especially in this Missoula's climate and all that. So, so I just thought I'd sort of give you some of the feedback I got from people I randomly visited with. So. Great, thank you. I think the ice ribbon, it is confusing to people. And um, I think one of the confusing things is people just haven't seen it before. And so they can't visualize what it's like to skate on a ribbon. Um, we actually took a field trip to the one in Spokane 
and it's pretty fun. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a hockey player. I'm not an ice skater. So it caters to people like me for sure. But <laughs> I went with Ryan Applegate, who is a, is a hockey player. Um, and he thought it was great. So, and there was people all, all over the place and it just really activates the space. And that's the goal is that we really want these parks to be activated in the winter time. And we, I can't think of a better way to do that in the winter besides ice. I mean, it creates a family friendly environment that will bring people from, you know, all types of people down there. And then it creates an atmosphere that other events could happen around that ice ribbon, such as holiday markets and Santa Claus and food trucks. And so I, I think it would be really successful if we can make it work. One of the things I likened it to is I, I shared with Nathan because he wasn't here at parks in 2000. Uh, three when we were designing the aquatics facilities and because we had always um, you know traditionally had rectangular traditional swimming pools citizens were having a challenging time imagining water slides and lazy rivers and splash parks and things like that and it, um, the working group who had opportunity to dive deeper into the details and have a better understanding and see the pro forma uh, business plan, they were on board and so was the council, but for people just sort of from hearsay, there was a little bit of um, like, what are what are we doing until we opened the doors of Splash and literally had a block, to, you know, multi-block long lines every day for the first several days uh, that people began to realize what a water park looks like compared to a rectangular swimming pool. So, you know, just in, in looking at our overall next steps, um, with a conceptual master plan, uh, we, we will uh, bring this back to park board for formal approval, but today we're looking more for, for your feedback, additional questions, uh, so we'll bring it back to you for formal approval. Uh, we do have a blue ribbon committee, uh, which is made up of uh, community leaders more on the, the fiscal and economic side, uh, helping to advise us. We have a leadership uh, committee that's made up of numerous stakeholders, whether uh, they're stakeholders because they're a business in the downtown, uh, a user group, uh, or a stakeholder, uh, another stakeholder in the city, for example, uh, public works and transportation. It's a large and diverse stakeholder group. We'll be going back to them. And then of course, after they're all on board and, and park boards on board, then uh, we would also get it approved by the downtown uh, partnership boards. That's the BID, the foundation and the MBA. And then ultimately, because it's a community park and facility, it would be adopted by city council. And so because of the nature of use and role that this string of parks plays, each one individually uh, by size would only meet the, the definition of neighborhood park in our master park plan, but as a string of parks along Ron's River Trail and where it's placed, it is com clearly a community park. It's uh, with community uh, venues in it uh, and when, it, when we get down to some of those specific details that Nathan touched on, for example, you know, exercise facilities at the Far East and of Best Reed Park didn't get a particularly high score. That doesn't mean we can't put those in for future phase. Uh, this happened at Fort Missoula Regional Park. Uh, for example, the, um, what is now the CCC Prairie and uh, Interpretive Trail was designated as possible additional playing fields. And the possible additional playing fields were denoted in a 2008 process that came out of a 2002 process. Well, the great thing about having a conceptual master plan and you complete the construction documents right before you go to construction and when you have the funding is we were able to make some plans um, and they, they reflect the way our community has evolved around the, the value of conservation even within a developed park. And, and so the, and it doesn't take away, you know, the potential future of something else happening, but it certainly um, allows some wiggle room. And then specific to the ice ribbon, and I, and I recognize we have some comments about no ice ribbon. So part of our due diligence uh, before we would ever build one is 
we would reach out to professional consultants in the area. We would do more interviews with um, our peers. And now that you've been open for a few years, how is it going? Is it sustainable? We would uh, work with companies similar to uh, the ones we worked with before opening aquatics and Fort Missoula Regional Park, or when we look at opening a community center and we complete a business plan. And that business plan is based um, very specifically on Missoula's demographics, our recreation uh, lifestyles, our discretionary time and money because people only have so much of each. And so when there's more things to do, they choose, they can't just do them all. And so we would do the performa. Uh, interesting when we open the, uh, the aquatic facilities, uh, we would have the person helping us, um, it was Ballard and King at the time, uh, Ken Ballard, and he was at our design table. And we would talk about the revenue impacts of a 15 foot slide tower versus a 20, 25, 30 or 35 foot slide tower. And two slides versus three versus four. And so we would do those same things with an ice ribbon, uh, meaning we go into this eyes wide open, knowing exactly what it would cost or whether we can break even, including cyclical maintenance. And then we let the community and the leadership make a decision around those projects. Uh, and again, with aquatics, when we added the 50 meter lake at Splash, we knew it would have um, negative impacts on the bottom line economically uh, compared to the lazy river and the pond. But we also knew it had immense positive benefits on the health wellness and it's what the community wanted. But at least they knew as a, a, as a community, if we want this really bad, it's gonna cost us a little bit more than if we would stay with something smaller. Hmm. So we, my recommendation is that we'll keep that in. There'll be a lot of narrative uh, that Nathan and the whole team will develop around this. Uh, we won't necessarily draw in every light pole and, and bench and, and plant but we will talk about it in the narrative and those things come later with construction uh, documents and when you get closer to actual uh, construction. The other piece I do wanna to touch on and then uh, I'll leave time for some questions is, you know, folks, have, you know, yes, if we were to build all five parks out in the promenade now, it, it would be a multi-million dollar big number. Uh, but we can do a lot of this in phasing. Uh, yes, there'll be certain restrictions around um, infrastructure, but a couple of projects uh, coming up very, very quickly is the expansion of the Higgins Avenue Bridge to include bike and walk lanes on either side. So that's going to literally um, add, uh, I think, 12 feet to the east and 13 feet to the west for bike, bicycle pedestrian facilities. During that construction, we'll be removing the parking from underneath and finding new places for those people to park. When that construction is done, MDT is required to reclaim uh, the site to original condition, or we could change order to reclaim us to whatever that first step is to get us to what could be under the bridge, thereby saving funds. Uh, MDA, we have plans. We know we have a lot of work to do on the pavilion. It's getting near the end of its life cycle as it relates to canopy and electrical utilities. So rather than invest um, more than a quarter million dollars in those improvements uh, just for the canopy, what if we are able to make multiple improvements by increasing that just uh, incrementally uh, rather than spending the funds over twice? And then another certain project is um, in working with public works and uh, our stormwater program, we are putting in an infiltration gallery. They already are, they already have the grant funds under the existing mound in Karis Park. So if we go through with that construction project today, uh, the, the deal would be is that after you tear up the mound and dig it out and place the infiltration system in, you restore the way it looks today. Well, with a new and adopted plan that we should have by fall, uh, we can ask for it to be restored to in the direction we're going. And so we can, through projects, through routine maintenance, through changes uh, and through cyclical efforts, we can start to implement this plan in a very effective and efficient way that moves us toward our end goal or vision uh, throughout the planning process. So part of a good, you know, why do we have a vision? 
Um, certainly, uh, all these documents are great for communicating that vision. Uh, it was absolutely critically important for us as we look at growth policy and rather than uh, growing outward into a suburban environment, we're looking at growing inward and upward that places immense pressure on our park system and many other systems. It should make things more affordable, especially for transportation and education and utilities. But we need to do something with these parks that allow that growth to happen and give all these new residents uh, to this already dense area and these new guests, these tourists, places to go, things to do year round. Thank you, Donna. Uh, are there any questions or comments from any member of the board? Go ahead, Margie. Uh, I do have another question, Donna. Since I'm new to the board, what what would you what can we do as board members to help facilitate moving these projects along or this information? Uh, well, the first step, and I think a lot of you took part in this, was just reaching out, making sure people were filling out the forms and participating and then bringing us the information back. So thank you for doing that. That is really important because the more people we reach, the, the better the plan is, the more people understand it, uh, the more support we get. Our next step uh, will be to bring this back to you. I am guessing sometime in either August or September and be looking for um, you to adopt the plan. And so any feedback you get between uh, now and, and the next time you see it, please do share if you see questions. Uh, what we would bring to you in um, August, likely September, is uh, any of the last changes. And so Nathan has just been an absolute superstar in this process and all of his design work. Um, I, I really don't know where we'd be with but he's got a bunch of things lined up. Uh, he's meeting with the parkour community. Uh, we're meeting with MDT. Uh, we're meeting with Northwest Energy around the big art. And so there'll be more detail uh, brought to you in this plan to some degree along with the narrative as well as phasing and, and a, um, a engineer's probable uh, cost estimate that'll be pretty broad. So we will be looking to you for adoption and then uh, support as we go forward that onto city council um, and the rest of the community. And right now, like I said, uh, we often have big projects like this. Uh, Fort Missoula was one of them, where for years in the CIP, uh, the funding mechanism was TBD, to be determined. <laughs> and, and, and ultimately, um, there was enough shared vision, enough uh, communication, enough gra uh, grassroots uh, on the ground effort that it became a reality. And uh, that's, anticipate that happening here. The good news at this site is, is there's many more funding partnership potentials than we had in a project like Fort Missoula. So it's finding those partners. Uh, you know, helping us with that, uh, helping us with outreach to city council members, why? Why now? Uh, why this? And then helping us balance that uh, in, in July, I'll give you a little bit of a brief update later today about uh, budget and budget process and timeline. Uh, but Ryan will join me in July and we'll be asking you to help us prioritize, you know, capital improvement program uh, projects versus budget. You will see the um, downtown master park plans in there. The number will be a fairly significant way point it'll get better as we go on but those uh that communication piece uh is is huge with park board that you can if you can truly understand and believe and support what we're doing that that's our goal and if you're not there then we we view um your role on park board all of you as um you know you're you're the net if you will or or the fabric that captures what our community wants and so that outreach especially to groups that often are not heard is really important. Thanks, Donna. Wendy or Daniel, you have any questions, comments? No, I mean, I appreciate the presentation, great presentation. And, um, you know, I've the comments I've heard from the public have also been really um, positive. So, um, and it was, it's, like the ice ribbon and the conversations we had earlier about different components, I think um, 
when was it that we got the presentation months ago that did have some of the visuals from the field trips that really, it did help a lot um, yeah. to get the visual on that. So really nice presentation. I agree. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Donna. Um, I just, first of all, I, I think I might've had something to do with some of that parkour stuff. So I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I, the truth got, comes out. Two kids in parkour and uh, we were at a, a like a par barbecue for a birthday and there were some other parkour families there. And I said, well, you know, there's a comment period going on right now. And um, I think uh, Kent got uh, a message right away and they, they probably then pushed their community. But that's, that's really what we want. We want public comment. And I'm always amazed um, at how hard it is to get everyone to participate and all the links and efforts that you guys go through to offer the public an opportunity to comment. I think Becky does a great job. And I'm not sure, Donna, if, if between now and the next time we talk about this in August or so, if there's any opportunity to share more of the vision again with the public and allow for any additional comments to come in. I, it's not a process. I know that you want to go on forever. But um, this, when this comes to fruition, this will be a major component to our city and to our downtown amenities. I mean, we're talking about a, a reimagination that really has a wonderful vision to it. So it would be great to get as many people on board as possible to make it successful. Certainly as we go through the uh, public process with the adoption by all of the downtown partnership boards, um, this board and city council, each one of those holds its own um, engaged public process. and. As you all know, in, in the public sector, and especially in Parks and Recreation, we never stop taking comments or receiving ideas. Uh, we just encourage it by a certain timeline so that we can move on to the next step um, of design development and doing some costing and phasing. Uh, we will certainly leave some things as, uh, if you will, in the plan, uh, but, to, but requires further research, like something as significant as um, the ribbon uh, because we know they have long-term costs and we also know that sustainability is huge and so it'll be measuring you know what are the benefits of year-round use and uh, we also find in facilities like this um, sometimes there's there's some equity achieved we reach uh, groups we never reached before uh, splash and currents were certainly examples of that uh, and so well, it'll unfold over time. I'm, I'm very confident uh, that there'll be some changes, uh, but once we land on a plan sometime early, uh, late this summer, early fall, it will be very close to the, to the community's vision and intention. Great, thank you, Donna. I don't see anybody in the waiting room right now. Um, we'll give a, just a few seconds here. Maybe somebody wants to call back in. There was a person who called in earlier and just to remind uh, members of the public, when you call in, you will be placed in a waiting room and you will sit into the waiting room until we're ready for comment. And that's when we'll admit you, uh, unmute you and, and give you three minutes. So please, if you do call in, don't hang up. We'll get to you, I promise, and just hang out in the waiting room. All right, um, I do not see anybody in the waiting room. So we're gonna move on now to agenda item 3.2. And again, we will uh, open this up to public comment. So if you'd like to call in, please do so. Um, this is a FY 2020 budget recap and FY 21 strategic goals as related to the budget, uh, Donna and Ryan. Um, so Ryan's not here today and I'm gonna just cover things a little bit more um, orally. Uh, as you might not be very surprised, uh, we are in a constant state of flux right now and trying to figure out where we're going to end up with our budget cycle and uh, where fiscal year 21 timelines, but things are uh, becoming more clear. Uh, what I do, uh, what I have heard as recently as this morning is that things are looking relatively good uh, for the municipal or city side reimbursement related to COVID costs. 
that is going to be extremely helpful because the city, um, like any other governmental entity, has experienced some pretty significant increased costs as relate costs uh, related to COVID. Um, and so what it should mean is that uh, many of our costs will be reimbursable if they were direct uh, result of COVID. So that's going to be helpful. We didn't have that information last month when we talked about this uh, with you a little bit. There's also the CARES Act, and we suspect uh, that there will be some eligible uh, projects programs uh, in the CARES Act for municipalities. Uh, that's still un we um, have experience, uh, we're estimating that by end of year, we will have experience um, just in supplies, materials, signage, face coverings, um, sanitation products, uh, that we will have experienced somewhere around $150,000 in additional costs just for those products, supplies, materials, uh, additional um, cleanings of portalette restrooms, those kinds of things. So about $150,000 to give you a round number uh, since uh, March 17th through June 30th, we're trying to keep everybody um, informed on signs uh, for uh, keeping things as sanitary as we can. That does not at all include, um, you know, cost of employees, uh, because I would uh, guess that at least um, Becky, our communications person, myself, and uh, have spent about three quarters or more of our time for about two months uh, specific to COVID, uh, COVID messaging, uh, COVID policy implementation, and then the constant um, change in uh, whether it's governors, uh, you know, closures to reopening, and then health officers interpretations, and then uh, you know, CDC and who updates based on data. So every time those changes happen, you go through another cycle of uh, uh, upping, you know, redoing your policy, redoing your uh, protocols, uh, adding to your signage, whatever the case may be. Uh, we also had quite a bit of um, family medical leave related to daycare with schools and daycares uh, closed. And so uh, we had a number of employees uh, who were working somewhere between half and three quarter time, uh, trying to juggle everything. And uh, in their commitment and loyalty to the, to the city and the service they provide all of us was absolutely phenomenal. You know, I think about how many parents we have who had both school age kids and preschoolers and both um, they're either single parent or both partners in the household are full time workers and uh, we, we still got a lot done. I, admittedly, we are uh, behind where I'd like to be at this state, uh, but uh, everything takes longer. On the labor side, uh, we had uh, quite a bit of cost in what we called public health safety administrative leave. There was uh, at least two to three weeks where we worked in split shifts while we tried to figure things out. And so employees were working closer to 30 hours a week, but being paid 40. And uh, now though we are back, uh, all, all folks on board, uh, we have started recruitments again. Uh, we're moving forward with implementing our reorganization restructure plan, which grows our capacity. Uh, we have posted the urban forester again. Uh, we're looking to post the develop parks manager who would report to TJ. And then um, we would also be looking to post a conservation lands manager who would report to Morgan. And so that's all, um, that's all going forward. I mentioned earlier uh, today uh, with aquatics, that's probably our biggest challenge. We are anticipating uh, a shortfall of about $130,000 at the end of this fiscal year. Aquatics is always um, a challenge because it's splash. Just in a nutshell, uh, the aquatics budget is, uh, you know, around uh, 1.2, 1.3 million. And of that, about half of that comes from splash during approximately half a splash a season. So what that next down to is in about six to eight weeks, 
we generate somewhere to, close to about one quarter to one third of our total gross revenue for both aquatic facilities. If those short time periods are greatly impacted by uh, thunderstorms, cold weather, a pump that went down that we can't replace or a smoky season, then we don't hit our numbers. If we have great weather, uh, uh, for example, you have uh, uh, the ideal day is it's going to be between um, 85 and 88 degrees with no clouds. <laughs> and it starts that way and it ends that way. And those will be $20,000 days to give you an idea. Well, um, that means that we are filling to capacity and capacity at that swimming pool at that water complex is uh, 1400 visitors at a time. And keep in mind they're transitioning. That's not in a day. It's at a time. And so there can be well over 1400 visitors. Um, and of that gross, about 30% of it actually comes from sales at the concession stand. Uh, snacks, meals, uh, novelties. And so uh, one of our biggest challenges this year is uh, it's looking like our, the governor's order says capacity will be 75%. But if you follow the rest of the governor's orders, the CDC best practices and the health officer orders, we're looking more at a couple hundred people in that facility as our maximum. And so those are the things that we're trying to balance uh, in budget. So long, long story around budget is while we had um, some considerable costs uh, that were not you know, anticipated, obviously, because we, we didn't know uh, last year this time that COVID might strike and that we would be in this environment, we also took great lengths uh, to really, I feel, manage our staff and our resources really well. And because we already have um, policy in place where we recover on average across all programs, and so it varies by program, but on average across all programs, somewhere close to 80% of the cost of the program. So what that means is if we didn't pull the program, there were many costs we were not incurring. You still incur some costs. Um, bottom line is uh, we think we're only gonna be, you know, $200,000, $250,000 off the mark at the end of our fiscal year in a very long winded roundabout story uh, between more expenditures and less expenditures and saving, not knowing where weather is going to be yet. As a department, we think it's gonna be in the quarter million dollar area, um, which I have to say out of a, um, you know, a $7 million budget, that feels pretty good. And that's without knowing for sure what we might get reimbursed with through FEMA. So we might be in better shape. We should be in better shape than what I just reported. So huge, um, you know, again, this, the, the team has been incredible. Uh, I, I can't say enough uh, good stuff about um, Ryan Applegate and his role in just the, the daily uh, checks and balances on the fiscal side and, uh, and then the whole team and keeping everybody safe. It's, it's been an effort. Uh, we, we estimate that everything takes us about 30% longer because of all of the face coverings and the gloves and the one person per vehicle and on and on and on. Uh, but, you know, so far um, we've been healthy. Uh, and, uh, and as I've been telling and sharing with our employees, now's the time to double down because our, our residents and our, our visitors now to Montana and Missoula um, we all come from different places and different levels of understanding of the facts and the data and uh, beliefs and what is keeping us safe and what's not. And then on top of all of that, you know, we add uh, the, the recent um, uh, events around racial inequities and injustices. And uh, it just adds another, another layer of... Um, consideration that obviously is, you know, more important than almost anything else we're dealing with. And I think our staff in our city has dealt with that quite well too. Um, trying, to, trying to work uh, with folks. Uh, you may have seen um, letters going up on the mountain or uh, painting 
uh, going on walls and we're, we're trying to be very judicious about keeping everything uh, clean, safe, and, and without judgment, um, obviously it's a very uh, politically charged issue for a whole bunch of reasons. So that's my overall budget report. Um, and hopefully you can tell I'm, I'm feeling rather comfortable with our numbers. You know, I wish I could tell you we were making money. We're not <laughs> in our program services, but, um, but we're holding our own. I think we've done really well. Budget will kick off. Um, inside the city, uh, our budget documents and requests are due June 17th. And we will, the mayor will present his budget to the city council on Wednesday, July 8th. We are in the process of updating, um, we're providing comments to the mayor and the city council strategic goals right now. Uh, and the city's uh, and mayor council strategic goals are very similar to uh, our park board and our park department. It's just ours are obviously more specific to the work we do, but they very much fall in line with the overarching goals. Uh, so um, one of the things I really like that we're doing from a budgetary perspective, citywide, and I, and I, feel, um, I feel like we've always done this in parks, uh, but we all, we're, citywide we're looking at results-based management uh, through the eyes of the resident. And so it's not that we're, you know, the example um, often shared is, it's not that we're adding a new um, park or a new playground. It's that we are improving uh, access and equity and opportunities for wellness for the residents who live nearby. And, uh, it, you know, it's, and so our um, criteria that we're looking at right now would be around um, safety. And that would range from things like crime prevention through environmental design to mandated uh, safety and legal measures. And that could range anything from trees and bridges, you know, real infrastructure type things, uh, aquatics, uh, to how do we address aging infrastructure and make sure that it uh, maintains its safe, uh, safe use and functionality all the way to just general human safety. And when we look at that, we look at both physical and um, emotional safety, again, getting back um, to a big overarching lens and, uh, and criteria, which is equity and access. Uh, does every resident have access to a park uh, within 10 to 12 minutes? And does that park have appropriate amenities to serve that resident? Do they have access um, that's equitable to open space and to community facilities? Do they have easy access, ideally uh, a quarter mile from a primary commuter trail or a greenway so that they do not have to own a car or be able to drive a vehicle to get to work, school, play, or shopping? Um, are we sustainable? Are we uh, paying attention to ecosystem services, climate resiliency, uh, climate and conservation? Are we taking care of our place, protecting our habitat? And uh, particularly for those most impacted uh, during those smoke season, during those floods, the drought, we all know that our weather patterns have got have, um, increased in intensity. Is the project ready? Uh, do we have partners? Do we have a vision? Do we have a plan? Do we have funding or access to funding? So it's sort of that concept of uh, shovel readiness, if you will, whether it's a project or a, um, a uh, program service. And then is there connectivity? And connectivity um, plays a big role. I mean, it can come in different ways. It can come through habitat, obviously. Uh, and it can also come through uh, transportation. Uh, it can come through uh, connections of mul uh, meeting the needs of multiple um, and goals and outcomes, if you will. So those are some of our criteria and what Ryan and I and the rest of the team would like to do is share that in, in more detail with you and show you how we're applying those things uh, during a July workshop with the board and then get your feedback on that. And that'll be right before we go to city council with presentations. Thank you, Donna. Um, are there any questions or comments from the board? Well, I have a question. When you were um, 
talking about thing, current events that are happening and um, the, the Parks and Recs Department and the city stance on those. And then you went right into talking about equity and access is such a priority. Um, you know, in the business I'm working in, land trust, it's been really great to see land trust stepping up um, to actually make a public statement about what's happening, especially with the Central Park um, issue with the African-American birder um, who was threatened. And I wondered if you considered the opportunity, I mean, I was just looking at the webpage where we do state those values. Um, has there been any consideration of actually posting something about what we stand for and um, that these things are not okay. Have you guys had that conversation? You know, um, it's been interesting. You and, and I think most of the board, except for maybe uh, our, our two newest member, I know that equity is um, a clear part of our strategic goal as a, as a board and that mm -hmm. we have been multiple meetings in multiple arenas, if you will, uh, with the Interfaith Collaborative, around health equity with the health department and partners, uh, been meeting with social justice at the county level. And um, it, it is in our um, city council and mayor's strategic goal as well is equity. Uh, our focus over the last several years has been reaching home and attainable housing and, and uh, sheltered uh, homelessness, unsheltered homelessness and making pretty good strides in that. I did bring that up this morning at the um, mayor's leadership team because while we've been talking about an equity policy in parks and in the um, entry to your brochure talks about equity policy and ac access and the, and the um, things we're trying to do. It also talks about, uh, we've done uh, some work around indigenous uh, people and lands, uh, which is really uh, important. Uh, but uh, recently, our new police chief, uh, Jason White, and the mayor put out a video uh, specific to the racial. Um, oh, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that either. I can forward that to you. That'd be great. I'd be curious to see it. And, and um, at this point, I feel... Uh, the parks can absolutely state where we're at, but um, I've been put pressing a little bit more for that to come because of the, uh, the uh, you know, Black and Brown Lives Matters uh, issues related to that. I feel like it also needs to come and because of the, the, you know, correlation, the direct relationship to police, it feels like it needs to come from someplace in addition or in, I'm gonna, in this case, maybe above or other than parks. Uh, yeah. It, uh, it's a bigger issue than parks right now. And uh, It is, but I've seen it work both ways. And we've talked so much about wanting to provide leadership through the parks department, which we have. And it's almost like saying nothing at this point goes against our values. Um, and I think it can go either way. You, you do need the statement from the top um, and then it's easier to respond, but that's, there's another way to do that, which is to state, make our, you know, statement. And then that puts pressure. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not being critical at all, obviously. Uh, no, um, it's just that it's not saying anything right now says something. Agreed. And Agreed. I've just have been totally impressed. Non, you know, land trusts are so non-political. They work. They have worked forever to stay out of the fray, and they are speaking up about the connection between their mission and their values, and what's happening. And I just then uh, then it inspires everyone else, and that's how change happens. So I'm, I'm figured you would be having these conversations, and I was curious what you were thinking. I, um, I, I too would be interested in a statement. I also want to be um, cognizant of, of pressure that that may or would put on you individually, Donna. 
Um, and so maybe if, if that conversation can happen and you need some assistance from the board and some backing, or if it would be more appropriate for the board to make an independent statement that's not from the city that could add some pressure, I'm not sure, but I, um, I think Missoula is a special town and, and there's a lot of compassion in this town, but I think um, there are some things that need to be publicly stated about our mission and our intent and, and the way we want to function and, and the way we want to be an important part of the solution in our community. I really appreciate that from, from all of you. It, that's, uh, it's a wonderful place to be a director of parks and recreation. Yeah. Well, it's I, wonderful to have the right person at the helm. <laughs> I will follow up. Um, I do have my meeting with um, uh, Mayor Angen and the CAO Dale Bickle on Thursday. Uh, certainly one of the items, of course, on my list of important things that we need to figure out. Uh, I want. I think there is a statement for parks and the value of open space and con you know conservation lands. Uh, you know, in all of our trainings, obviously we go into this in a significant way with our employees. We talk about it in our brochure, but if it it is not, I mean, out front right now, still on our websites is information on COVID. And uh, and I would agree with you. Uh, we need to be able to do both. Um, and you know, one needs to take lead now. Um, Donna, I do have a getting back to the budget itself. I I have a a question and maybe a request. Um, I remember when I first joined uh, the Parks Board, the budgeting process was quite a bit different than it is now. And um, the efforts that the city has made to, to move to a different kind of budgeting process. Um, and you know, the, the nice thing about the Parks Department is there is this element of, of accountability, running things like a business, making sure we're being stewards with funds and with programs and with land. And unlike other departments, you know, you, you have this back and forth in your fiscal year and things that add to and take away from. I'm just wondering if you want to make any comments about how uh, the type of budgeting that we do in Missoula impacts the budget for the parks department. Um, well, so I think some of the changes um, of course, the city budget, let me start way back. Super, super complicated. Uh, understanding what's coming from general fund taxes versus revenue sharing um, at the state level versus uh, different uh, fees for services, whether the development related franchise fees uh, related to um, different franchises and utilities. So uh, for me to even tell you that I can begin to explain the entire budget to you uh, would not be accurate. Uh, from a parks perspective, and now what I feel is going to be a city perspective, um, that budget, I think, is going to be much more based. Uh, we're making many efforts within the city to align with our strategic goals and our adoptive plan, something that we've done Armin, since at least 2004 when we first adopted the master park plan. And, and then again, uh, in 2006, when we added um, the uh, updated open space plan, and from there, any number of plans that we've added to that. So our whole work plan, our whole budget is focused on what the communi community engagement has led to um, adopted plans, which has led to our work plans and implementation of those through budget requests. And I think what has been, um, what the park department has become known for, uh, at least with city leadership and especially with fiscal leadership, is that there is an accountability of um, and an understanding of direct and indirect costs, uh, the cost of doing business, uh, really thinking, trying to at least every year, uh, what do we do that's important and um, mandated and what do we do that may not be as important that we spend way too many resources on. And so by, uh, by working with boards and citizens and user groups, I feel like uh, we're able to really 
grapple with that. And I think the piece that Ryan has brought us and uh, uh, maybe of interest to many of you, uh, now all of the larger departments are following the park department's model for a business manager uh, within their department for that level of fiscal responsibility and ability to talk uh, fiscal uh, terminology and numbers with finance people. Uh, and so Ryan uh, was kind of a leader in that and uh, doing it uh, with all departments, but what you're, what you're seeing more of now are, are balance sheets. You're seeing uh, multiple businesses, for example, just inside of parks uh, with Splash and Currents and the vending and the food in Fort Missoula uh, and how we operate so that um, citizens can, ha can have access to those numbers in a real way that's meaningful to them uh, because of all those complexities. There's still um, complexities that I think are really hard to understand. People really have a difficult time understanding pots of money in government. Uh, you know, I had a recent, um, you know, I frustrated a, a resident recently and why can't we fix their neighborhood tennis courts? Um, and so much comes into play. Uh, there's only certain funds available for capital projects. And you're not going to lay off employees to fix a court. Uh, and stop mowing, if you will. And, and we have equity because even though courts in that neighborhood are in bad shape, they have more services than other neighborhoods uh, just by design of their neighborhood. And so it's just really interesting. And I don't know if I'm getting close to answering your question, John, but- um, I Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. I like Wendy's interloper there. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> she snuck in before I could catch her. <laughs> yeah, I think, Part of where I was going with that and why I appreciate your, your answer is that oftentimes when you hear uh, people talk about things like big government or too many taxes or things like that, they have this general notion that the way a budget works is you try to get as much as you can, then you try to spend all of it so you can get more the next year and you just keep gobble, gobble, gobbling. And I, I really wanted to just put it on the record that the Parks Department has a different approach, um, not only to the, the way that they propose their portion of the budget, but to how they use funds and how fiscally responsible the Parks Department is. That's been an important thing um, for me when we first started looking at currents and looking at it in terms of a, of a business profit and loss statement. I think it really helped change the mindset to, of uh, staff and of the public and how, how Parks Department runs. So. I was egging you on really more because I, I think it's a kudos to the parks department that we have a structure in place and have Ryan to, to really um, count the pennies, you know, and, and be, be wise with how they're spent. So thank you very much. We feel, or I feel strongly, you know, the, the residents entrust us with a lot, their land, their families and their fight, their, their dollars, their tax dollars. And so, we take that very seriously. Yeah, thanks. Any more comments? I do not see anyone in the waiting room. And so I think we can move on to agenda item 3.3, the director of department city planning effort update. Donna gets to talk some more. <laughs> um, again, we will open this item up afterwards for public comments. So if you would like to go into the waiting room, please do so. So um, we have been a, a little bit slow uh, moving forward with some of the things we want to bring park board. And so I want to touch on that first. So in July, um, I am anticipating bring, uh, Nathan bringing forward the uh, Red Fern uh, Neighborhood Master Park Plan, uh, the city annexed to the area out by the airport, and that included Canyon Creek Village and their two and a half acre park. So we will have a neighborhood park to bring forward to you um, next month that uh, Nathan completed design on in February, uh, and we've just kind of been on hold a little bit as we catch up to some other things. Uh, Morgan has been engaging folks. So if you go to uh, Engage Missoula, uh, you will find the Clark Fork um, Islands natural area. That's the Klaus Islands out there, the Tower Street properties. Encourage you to take a look at that and share that, um, you know, excessively with your, uh, your uh, trap lines, if you will, uh, because we'll be looking at finishing that uh, management plan 
and then that becomes a appendix, if you will, or an additional component of the conservation lands management plan. Talks a lot about the islands as a uh, birding habitat and also a lot about trail connectivity and interpretation through there. The uh, other um, thing going on, I've, I've somewhat referenced it in my conversation with you here today, but the, the city um, is going through a bit of a uh, re realignment itself, especially around our relationships with development and how development services, public works, engineering, parks and recreation, Missoula Redevelopment Agency, we all play roles in what future development looks like and development isn't always as easy as we would like it to be for the developer. And yet residents who have lived here don't feel like they should be paying for new development. And so there's this, there's these balances to achieve. And, and then we have these overarching goals around growth policy and conservation and equity. And so um, part of what we're going to be doing the rest of this week uh, with uh, city employees who become part of that giant functional work team that supports, advises, reviews development is we're all gonna be working together how, uh, to see how we can get better at that. Uh, the other thing you're gonna see in July, of course, is uh, I wanna reserve as much time as we can for the budget and the CIP process. My guess is we'll still be in this virtual environment or, or Zoom setting, uh, though uh, we may uh, by August or September uh, choose to meet uh, maybe at the Fort Missoula Regional Park Pavilion or something. Uh, if everybody's uh, voice is up for it and we can uh, shout loud enough to hear each other, uh, we, uh, we would certainly entertain an in-person meeting uh, with distancing as uh, if we can keep our numbers where they're at related to uh, COVID. Uh, in that light, uh, we have been through uh, three uh, so-called incubation periods uh, without a COVID plus uh, started in Missoula. So uh, keep wearing those face covers and continue to distance and, and be careful. Uh, that again has been a, a big part of our efforts we have onboarded about 80 employees for summer camps. We are going forward with summer camps. They will start on Monday. Um, we are going to be much more place-based than travel-based, although we will have a limited amount of travel and, uh, and uh, those folks are ready to go. I mentioned to you, we will be opening uh, swimming pools yet on a very limited basis. Uh, uh, the numbers could be so limited that uh, in the first week it'll be open swim for up to 50 people every 90 minutes with a 30 minute sanitation shutdown in between uh, at currents. And then we hope to get to some number greater than that at Splash because opening Splash Montana with 50 people is a bit on the insane side. Um, we do have max swimming, uh, adult, and teen lap, uh, adult and teen lap swimming opening as well as uh, rental groups, aqua size, uh, things that we can more control. Open swim is a difficult thing to control. Uh, we're anticipating Bonner Band concerts potentially opening uh, to the uh, performance on June 17th with a reduced band and uh, demarcated sitting spa seating spaces. Uh, we are working with um, Missoula Downtown Association. Uh, they're working towards a uh, food truck Tuesdays, I believe it is. And so there'll be less trucks in Karis Park and uh, spatial uh, distancing will be outlined. So those things are uh, going forward as far as um, other planning efforts. We've had an incredible number of neighborhoods uh, and uh, processes that we still need to move forward on. Uh, we have the Clark Fork uh, River uh, Restoration and Access Project that Open Space Advisory Committee and um, City Council approved last November that we've really not been able to make any headway on just because we weren't already started and we haven't, we just got slowed down in staffing and ability to run our few RFPs for engineers and et cetera. Uh, though the work we have been doing like around the downtown master plan will uh, play well into that. Uh, we have uh, still to go forward as a waterworks trailhead project. Uh, we're still negotiating 
uh, easement documents with a, a nearby landowner uh, to do that project. Uh, we're still assessing trails and trailheads. Uh, Marie is moving forward with a reforestation project. So we're trying to get a lot of, of the infrastructure in place um, and the planning. Uh, so we know exactly where we're gonna plant, what we're gonna plant, uh, getting irrigation to the site if it's necessary. Uh, we'll be having an ask for a water truck uh, with baffles that's appropriate. Uh, the current water truck is not appropriate for us uh, trying to reforest our community. And then of course, we're looking at species that are as water, uh, low water use as possible, but can are viable in an urban environment. Uh, Morgan continues to um, analyze trails and trailheads for improvements there. Uh, we are working, um, the long range transportation plan has kicked off again. And so I strongly encourage Park Board to look at that. So as we're going through budget process and planning process, um, one of the areas that impacts us significantly is transportation and it impacts parks, but it also impacts every individual in this community. And the more we can think about moving humans and cargo, as opposed to cars and trucks, the better off we're all going to be because it helps us achieve equity goals, environmental goals, and so and socioeconomic goals. Um, and so if you can take the time to track the long range transportation plan and particularly, um, I would encourage you in each of your neighborhoods as likely candidates for active transportation, um, even if it's going from your household to your favorite trailhead or park, uh, to submit projects to the long range transportation plan that get at connectivity by foot and bike and bus rather than reliant on cars. Because long term, uh, to me, that's our future uh, from, a, from a planet and people uh, health perspective. Uh, those are uh, some of the, the, the real big ones I see coming our way. Uh, I will share the uh, equity video with you and then um, continuing to work with you on what the July agenda will be. But again, it'll be largely budget CIP, some conservation land stuff and Redfern Park. Thank you, Donna. Any questions from members of the park board? I have one um, just because it's in my neighborhood. Do you know where we stand with Ninkapata? Ah, yes. Um, we, <laughs> that's, that's a hard question because um, we have <laughs> not been able to meet again with the neighborhood. Um, a lot of our meetings were placed on hold and even with some groups, it's hard to meet uh, because of technology that wouldn't be the case in this, uh, uh, the situation here, but um, with Ningpata, we still need to work with, um, the Missoula Water Company to make sure that we have the land set aside where the tanks were. And, and there's a verbal commitment there. We designed the park plan around that. I've talked to the Ningpata Farviews, uh, Patty Canyon leadership team about um, continuing uh, to work to build that, that grassroots and they have been approaching their council ward leadership. I did uh, get a request from one of the um, Councilwomen to meet on uh, some of those uh, projects. Uh, I know from a budgetary standpoint, what I'm hearing at least initially from the mayor and the council is they want, they want to achieve or get as close as they can to a net zero property increase for all kinds of good reasons. Uh, that is the good news with the FEMA uh, reimbursement. It, it might bring that closer to reality, but it also doesn't um, provide a lot of promise. Uh, we do have requests um, for master planning at Playfair, completing Fort Missoula and transferring Knife River uh, parcel to the city, developing a plan for the triangle piece by Larchmont. Um, the university, uh, some of the university leadership has asked for a, a broader based planning process that includes Missoula College, uh, specifically Maryland. Uh, we do have requests uh, to complete Syringa uh, Park bike jumps. Uh, Bellevue has a request in for improvements. Uh, Ningpata and Whitaker uh, Bonner 
uh, University neighborhood has uh, multiple requests in for improvements to Bonner Park. Uh, Linda Vista parks across the board uh, want um, new infrastructure in Maryland, Jeffrey, and increased maintenance throughout. Uh, and then our, our areas that are most efficient, uh, who we don't hear from as much, we're really super focused on Franklin to Fort, Emma Dickinson, uh, West Side. Uh, we are um, got temporarily placed on hold, but we have uh, had positive messaging around um, uh, the uh, North Side Ball Diamond, which is not owned by the city, it's owned by the diocese to be able to get that under agreement for redevelopment. And so we've been focusing on that uh, quite a bit. Uh, so again, long answer to Nkpada, I can promise that I'm overly hopeful that a lot's gonna get done in the, in the face of what I think is gonna come first, which will be <clears throat> recovery out of COVID, um, not necessarily in this order. <clears throat> A, res a response and next actions related to um, recent uh, racial events and, uh, and around equity, I think, is, is finally going to come ho even higher on the list from a community-wide, not just from a, a parks and partners uh, perspective. And the other thing I do expect um, to rise um, up even more is, um, just how do we approach sustainability and space needs overall? I don't know um, if the board is uh, aware, but uh, the city and county are actively engaged in securing the courthouse in downtown Missoula uh, for primary offices for city hall and a lot of county commissioner related services. And so that'll be another huge project. So <laughs> thank you. We're mostly focused on open space first because those things are funded and they've already been approved by council and by the community through plans. Uh, Friends of Missoula Parks has a uh, as yet to be scheduled date with Neil to go out to Bellevue and to see where we might be of some assistance there. Um, and we have a couple of other little projects that are percolating up towards the top and people have contacted us, but nothing more really to say other than what you've said. All right, any other questions or comments? I do not see anybody in the waiting room. So uh, I do not see any future or held items in uh, number four. So with that, we are ready to adjourn unless there's other questions. Could I have a motion, please? I move to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Meeting's over. Thank you all very much. Sure appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great seeing your faces. Mm -hmm. Thanks.